Today I'll be giving part two of uh, an introduction to proof theory. Uh, this will be a continuation of the first part of the talk, an introduction to proof theory one on the sequent calculus, and we'll build off of what I discussed there. Today I'll be discussing three different concepts, namely invertibility, cut elimination, and proof search, uh, specifically with respect to the sequent calculus that was introduced in the first talk. And I'll also be mentioning results which were discussed there as well. Now just to give a small overview of the talk, what I'm going to do first is just discuss what are called invertible rules. <clears throat> invertible rules are rules in a sequence system where derivability of the conclusion implies derivability of the premises. And these are useful for various reasons which I will be going over in that first section. Uh, this also will be used to help establish what is called cut elimination. So although I'm not going to prove that the cut rule is eliminable in our system uh, in general, what I will be doing is looking at various cases and showing how cut can be removed and give a general idea about how cut elimination works. After that, I will then talk about how after cut has been eliminated from our system, our system is what is called an analytic proof system, which oftentimes means that it has the subformal properties. This is what we will mean by analyticity here in the context of this talk. I'll then explain how just by observing the structure of the inference rules of the system, that we can conclude that classical propositional logic is decidable, something which uh, we already know and which is well known, but uh, something which uh, give, sheds light on how this proof theoretic method can be used to establish decidability of logics. After that, I will then explain and give an example of proof search showing how this works. In other words, this will be uh, or is a type of a decision procedure or decision algorithm which decides a logic. So I'll give an example of proof search showing how a decision procedure can be written for classical propositional logic, and this can be adapted to other settings as well. At the very end, I will summarize everything. Okay, so what is an invertible rule? Here I will discuss two different notions of invertibility. <clears throat> the first notion is defined as follows. A rule is invertible if and only if, uh, if an instance of the conclusion is derivable, then the premises uh, are derivable as well. In other words, one way to put this in short <clears throat> is that derivability of the conclusion <coughs> excuse me, implies derivability of the premises. There also is a stronger version of invertibility referred to as height-preserving invertibility, or HP invertibility. Now, a rule is going to be HP invertible if and only if, whenever an instance of the conclusion of the rule is derivable with a height H, then the premises can be derived with a height less than or equal to h. In other words, uh, what this means is that derivability uh, of the conclusion with a particular proof uh, implies derivability of the premises, and the height of those derivations is bounded by the uh, derivation height for the uh, conclusion of the rule. Now, what are the benefits of um, invertibility and HP invertibility? <clears throat> well, it turns out that invertibility can be quite useful in establishing HP admissibility uh, or just admissibility and elimination results. So this um, deals with showing that certain rules in your proof system are redundant. This is discussed in the first lecture. So if you'd like to see how certain structural rules in the sequent calculus are admissible or eliminable, uh, this is discussed there. Um, now, with respect to our sequent calculus, the weakening and contraction rules are HP admissible and eliminable in their own right. But if you deal with more complex proof systems, oftentimes you have to show invertibility of rules before you can show, for example, contraction admissibility. So this really is useful in helping establish these results. And as we'll see uh, over the course of the next uh, few slides or momentarily, um, showing cut elimination in our sequent calculus uh, depends on or uses the height-preserving invertibility of certain uh, rules in our proof system. <clears throat> Another thing which is uh, very nice is that if you have that your rules are invertible, then this means that if you do proof search, meaning if you give me a formula or give me a sequence, and I apply the rules in reverse trying to construct a proof of that formula or sequence, uh, backtracking is not required in that process. So for example, imagine that I have, uh, I'm trying to construct a proof or extract a proof from a given sequence or formula by applying inference rules in reverse. If at some stage of this process I have a rule R1 that's applicable and a rule R2 that is applicable, <clears throat> if um, these rules are not, or if one of these rules is not invertible, then that means it's not the case that uh, 
the validity of the conclusion implies the validity of the premise. So if I apply this rule in reverse, I might go from a stage during a proof search where I have a sequence which is valid or which is derivable, and then what I deduce by applying the rule in reverse, one of the premises, is actually not um, derivable or is not um, valid. And so what would happen is, after I would complete uh, my process of extracting a proof, it could turn out that that proof is not actually a proof of the conclusion. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that that sequence, the conclusion of the proof, is not uh, provable. What it means is that when I had that choice of applying either the first rule or the second rule, I made the wrong choice. And so I then have to backtrack in my algorithm, go back to that step and apply the other rule instead. And this could of course make proof search rather complicated. Uh, now to make proof search more um, intuitive for the audience, what I'm going to be doing later on is give an example of successful and unsuccessful proof search by making use of our sequent calculus LCP. Now another thing that's useful uh, regarding invertibility is counter model extraction. <clears throat> now if a rule is invertible, what it means is that uh, the validity of the conclusion of a rule implies the validity of the premises. So if you think about the contrapositive of this, what this means is that if one of the premises of the rule is invalid, then the conclusion is invalid. So if I do proof search and I obtain something which looks like a proof of my sequence system, and one of the initial sequence is not an axiom, but is something which is invalid, I can construct a counter model for it. And since the invalidity of something is carried downward in the proof, the invalidity will be carried downward to the conclusion, and the conclusion will be invalid as well. And that counter model will, so long as the rules are of a nice shape, which they are in our case, be a counter model of the conclusion as well. Again, I will give an example of this later on in this talk to get the idea across better. Now it turns out that in our sequent calculus, all of the logical rules are height-preserving invertible, okay? both the negation rules and the implication rules. So what I'm going to do now is explain how we can prove uh, that the negation left rule is height-preserving invertible in our sequent calculus. So let's go through the proof of that claim. Now, uh, just as a reminder, the negation left rule is of the following form. It says that if I have a sequence which is derivable and has a formula B on the right-hand side, I can flip it over to the left-hand side of the sequence so long as I introduce a negation in the process. <coughs> And now what we're going to do is prove the invertibility of this by induction on the height of the given derivation. As I mentioned in the previous talk, uh, the height of a derivation is essentially the uh, length of the longest path inside of a proof. Okay. So a proof is, has a tree-like structure, and if you look at each of the paths throughout that tree-like structure, and you calculate how many sequences exist along those, path, uh, along those paths, the maximum um, number among all of those numbers will be the height of the derivation. And this is uh, used quite often in proving uh, results in proof theory is this notion of the height of a proof. So we're going to use that here. And now in the base case, we assume that the height of our derivation is 1. Well, this must mean that our uh, sequence that was derived was derived by means of the axiom rule, where we have a sequence of sequence. Now, <clears throat> observe that the sequence obtained by the axiom rule is an instance of the conclusion of the negation left rule. Why is that the case? Well, on the left-hand side of the sequence occurs a negated formula, namely not b. And now the question is, can we come up with a proof in our sequence calculus for classical propositional logic, where instead of having a not b on the left, we have a b on the right-hand side? Well, it's quite easy to see that this would also be another instance of the axiom rule because we have this A occurring on the left and on the right. So that covers the base case. Let's now move on to the inductive step. So in the inductive step, we're only going to consider the case where the last rule applied is the implication right rule. Uh, this is typically how proofs go. In proof theory, you prove the result by induction on the height of your derivation, and then you make a case distinction based on the last rule that's applied in the proof that you're analyzing. So here, the last rule we're assuming is the implication right rule. <coughs> And now we assume that the height of the given derivation is of uh, height n plus 1. And this little triangle here just indicates that there is some proof above this application of the implication of right rule. Now notice that the conclusion of this <coughs> is an instance of the conclusion of the negation left rule. 
Why is that the case? Because there is a not C occurring on the left of the sequence. In other words, there is a negated formula which occurs on the left of the sequence. And now our goal is to show that we can derive essentially the same sequence uh, with the same height or less, but where instead of having a not C on the left, we have a C on the right, which would be an instance of the premise of the negation left rule. So how can we show that? Well, if we observe the premise of the implication right rule, it is of height n, and it's one higher in this given derivation. And therefore, we can invoke the induction hypothesis, or inductive hypothesis, uh, to derive the same sequence, but instead, where we have a not C on the left-hand side, we have a C on the right-hand side. And now what we can do next is apply the implication right rule to this to obtain the desired sequence. So we have a proof of an instance of the premise where this not C has been moved to the right and the negation has been stripped off of it. So this gives an idea about how uh, HP invertibility is shown in general. Of course, to finish this proof, you would also have to consider um, the negation left case, the negation right case, and also the implication left case as well. Let's now move on to cut elimination, which is a very um, famous topic in proof theory. Now, before I go on to explain how cut can be eliminated in general from our given sequence system, what I'm going to do is give an example of how uh, cut is permuted upwards in a proof until it is deleted at the axioms. So let's look at this particular derivation that we're given, and I'll explain how cut can be deleted in a very methodical fashion. So observe that the not A is the cut formula occurring in the left premise and the right premise here. And we can observe, or we can see, that the not A's were obtained, or our principal formulae that are obtained from, the auxiliary formulae A occurring in the premise of the not right rule and the premise of the not left rule. In other words, looking at the not right rule, this A was used to uh, apply the not right rule and introduce the not A cut formula occurring in its conclusion and in a similar fashion with the um, left, or sorry, right premise of cut. But now if we look at these two sequence, this one has an A on the right and this one has an A on the left, and the context aside from that formula match, and so therefore we can actually apply cut to each of these axiom instances, giving this derivation where the cut has essentially been moved upwards. Well now if we look at the conclusion of this proof, it turns out that it is an instance of the axiom rule as well, because there's a formula B which occurs on the left and the right hand side. Now, although we can see that uh, this concluding uh, sequence here and the given proof is an instance of axiom, the axiom rule, um, what this example shows is that uh, is how cut elimination works, how it gets moved upwards in a proof. Now, there are things which are sort of reduced through this process which we use to establish that this process of eliminating cut will always eventually terminate. So the first uh, thing which decreases or could decrease when moving a cut upwards is the complexity of the cut formula, namely the number of logical connectives which occur in the cut formula. So if we look at this particular example, we have a not A as our cut formula in our given derivation. And in the second proof, we used A instead of not A which has a lower complexity because it does not have that negation uh, prefix to it. So that's the first thing which can decrease through cut elimination and which we use to our advantage to establish the elimination of cut, the complexity of the cut formula. And the second is the height of the cut premises. So notice here that the premises of cut in the given derivation had a height of two. Now in the second obtained proof, each has a height of one. So we notice that the height of the cut premises has decreased as well. <clears throat> now using these things, we're going to show or argue, we'll only look at a few cases, but it should get the idea across, that the cut rule is eliminable in the sequent calculus for classical propositional logic, namely LCP. So how are we going to show this? Well, we're going to prove the result by induction on pairs of the following form, uh, where we are doing induction based on the lexicographical ordering of these pairs. So what is the first component of the pair? The first component of our pair is the complexity of the cut formula, namely the number of logical connectives that it uh, possesses or contains. 
And the second component of, pair, of the pair is the sum of the heights of the derivations of the premises of cut. So the left premise of cut here uh, is shown to have a uh, derivation height of h1, and the right premise of cut has a derivation of height h2. So again, we're going to show this uh, that cut is eliminable um, by induction on the lexicographical ordering of these pairs. Okay. So now let's look at one case. Remember, there's a lot of different cases that pop up in cut elimination that you have to analyze. Again, we're only going to uh, analyze a few, but it should get the idea across to the viewer. So in the first case, let's assume that H1 is, uh, is, uh, is 1. In other words, the height of the derivation of the left premise of cut is 1. Now, in that case, the left premise of cut must be an instance of the axiom rule. We're also assuming that the cut formula A is principal in that axiom. Now, in this case, right, we have that this is the left premise of cut, and we have that this is the right premise of cut, gamma A sequent arrow delta. And we can see that the conclusion of cut is uh, the same or identical to its right premise. And what that means is that we can eliminate cut by simply just taking the derivation. Uh, which gives rise to the right premise of cut. And now cut is no longer occurring here. So that's how this case is resolved. Let's look at another case. In this case, we're going to assume that the cut formula uh, uh, is not B, so it's a negative formula. And we're going to assume that the cut formula is principal in both premises of um, this instance of cut or this uh, use of cut. What this means is that both of the uh, rules that are used to give rise to the premises of cut introduced that cut formula, in this case being not B. So in the left premise, we had that not B was introduced by the negation right rule, and in the right premise of cut, we had that not B was introduced by the negation left rule. And now what I'm going to do is show you how we can move the cut upwards in this case. So if we observe <coughs> the premise of the negation right rule and the premise of the negation left rule, we can see that in the premise of negation left, we have a B on the right. In the premise of the negation right rule, we have a B on the left. And the context, gamma and delta, or the side formula, are identical to each other. What this means is that we can apply the cut uh, rule to these uh, premises of these negation rules and cut on B instead of not B. Now, in this case, what has happened is the complexity of the cut formula has decreased because we're cutting on B as opposed to not B, and also at the same time, the heights have decreased as well. All right, let's look at another case showing how to eliminate cut. So here we're going to assume that our cut formula is an implication of the form B implies C. We're going to assume that it is principal in the left of cut meaning it was introduced by the negation, or sorry, implication right rule. And we're going to assume that it is not principal in the right premise of cut. So we're going to assume that some rule, in this case it's going to be the negation right rule, was applied to give rise to the right premise of cut, introducing this negated D which occurs in the uh, succeeded or consequent of the right premise of cut. Okay, so this is the, the situation we're going to analyze. Now if we look at the left premise of cut, and we look at the premise of the negation right rule, we can see that the left premise of cut has a B implies C in its uh, consequent or succeeding. And in the premise of the negation right rule, we have a B implies C in the antecedent. So now these sequence are rather similar. The only difference between them is that the left premise of cut has a not B in the conclusion, and the premise of negation right has a D in the antecedent. And so uh, if we're able to rectify this so that the context match, we can cut on the B implies C. And now this is how we're going to do that. First, we take the derivation giving rise to the left premise of cut. And then we take the derivation uh, giving rise to the premise of negation right, negation right rule. So observe that this uh, derivation will be of height h2 minus 1, since we're assuming uh, 
that the right premise of cut was derived with a height of h2, and this is one higher than the premise. And now we can invoke the HP invertibility of the uh, negation right rule, which uh, is something that we covered in the previous uh, section of this talk. So if we look at the sequence that's derived with the implication right rule, we'll have a not D occurring on the right hand side of the sequence. Now, since I know that the negation right rule is hyperserving invertible, I have a derivation whose height is at most h1, but where, instead of a not d being on the right-hand side of the sequence, I have a d on the left-hand side of the sequence. And now, by making use of that result, I have uh, obtained a proof of gamma d, sequent arrow b implies c, delta, and I already know that I have a derivation of gamma d b implies c, sequent arrow delta, and I can cut on this B implies C, yielding the sequent gamma D sequent arrow delta. Now, the conclusion that I need, or when I move the cut upwards, I need to show that the cut is moved higher in the derivation and the same sequent is derived. And so I can move the cut upwards and derive the same thing. Now, if we compare the conclusion to the originally given, um, in the originally given derivation, we have a not D on the right hand side. Here, we have a D on the left hand side. So what can we do? We can, um, we can apply the negation right rule and move this d to the right, introducing a negation when we do so. Now observe that the complexity of the cut formula b implies c is exactly the same, so that has not been reduced, but the, uh, the heights, the sum of the heights has been reduced by one, because now the right premise of cut uh, has a derivation whose height is h2 minus 1, as I mentioned previously. So we've um, you know, moved or shifted the, uh, the pair that we're using in this type of cut uh, farther down in the lexicographical ordering. So we're allowed to, um, this shows that the, this cut process will terminate since this is a, a smaller pair is associated with this cut. Okay, so now let's look at the consequence of cut elimination. Now, in the first talk, I defined LCP, which is the sequent calculus I've introduced for classical propositional logic. And that sequent calculus contained five structural rules. Weakening rules, contraction rules, and also the cut rule. So now, um, we can effectively, through our admissibility results of the weakening contraction rules discussed in the first talk and cut elimination, shown here, uh, we can obtain a new calculus or a fragment of LCP called LCP star, which just consists of the four logical rules for negation and implication, and also the axiom um, rule. And we know that this calculus is complete for the following reason. In the previous talk, we argued or showed that if some formula was a validity in classical propositional logic, then it was derivable in LCP, so in the calculus with the structural rules. But now we've shown that all the structural rules are limitable in LCP. In other words, anything which can be derived with them can be derived without them. That means that if you give me a validity of classical propositional logic, I can derive it in LCP. And due to this second fact, I can derive it without any of the structural rules. Therefore, it will be derivable in this new calculus, LCP star, this more refined calculus. And what's nice is that just by observing the logical rules of this calculus, we can determine that classical propositional logic is decidable. Now, it's well known that classical propositional logic is decidable, so what should be emphasized here is not the decidability of this particular logic, but the methodology that was used in uh, recognizing this fact. So you could have a sequence calculus for a more complicated logic for a different logic. For example, say intuitionistic propositional logic, whose calculus is not very different than the one presented here for uh, its classical version. And just by going through this process of eliminating the structural rules and doing cut elimination, one can come to the same conclusion that the logic is decidable by looking at um, the calculus that is obtained after all structural rules are removed.
Now what I'm going to do is try to explain how looking at these rules tells you that your logic is um, decidable. So I've written on the top of this slide, analyticity achieved. Now analyticity is not a rigorously defined notion in proof theory, but typically what we mean when we say that a, a proof system is analytic is that it has the subformal property or some variant thereof. Uh, for this talk, uh, we're going to say that analyticity means the same thing as the subformula property, but it does take on different versions in the literature. Um, what is the subformula property? Well, calculus has the subformula property when all the formulae used in the premise or premises of any rule are subformulae of those formulae which occur in the conclusion of the rule. We can see, for example, in the implication left rule, if we look at the left premise, uh, of course, the gammas and the deltas, the formulae which occur in these contexts, are subformulae of themselves in gamma and delta. But A is a strict subformula of A implies B. Similarly, B is a strict sub subformula of A implies B. So we can see that the complexity of the uh, premises is smaller than the complexity of the conclusion, and that it only makes use of subformulae of the conclusion. And so this is how we can recognize the citability of our logic. If you give me a formula and I apply these inference rules, these ones shown here on the slide, in reverse on that formula, that process will eventually terminate. Because every time I apply a rule in reverse, I get a structure which is less complex. It has less logical connectives. And so what this means is that there's only a finite number of proofs for any given provable formula. Now, if I know that there's only a finite number of proofs, what I can do is search throughout that finite space. So you give me a formula, I search throughout that finite space. If I find a proof of it, I know it's valid because it's derivable. And if I can't find a proof of it, then I know it's invalid. So this is how you can use the subformula property to recognize that a logic is decidable. Now here, again, we know that classical propositional logic is decidable. It's very easy to uh, give a decision procedure by making use of standard truth tables. Um, but this is another way of recognizing it by just looking at the structure of the inference rules and its corresponding sequence calculus. And this can be done for uh, different kinds of logics, substructural logics or modal logics, for example. Okay, so now I've explained that uh, just by looking at the structure of the rules, just because this new calculus we obtained after eliminating our structural rules has the subformula property that our logic is decidable, but knowing that a logic is decidable is different than actually writing a decision procedure for the logic. And this is where proof search comes in. Proof search is essentially a strategy for establishing the decidability of a logic. <clears throat> and I'm going to go over it on this slide. So <clears throat> let's quickly go over proof search. Uh, how does it work? You give me a logical formula or you give me a sequence, uh, depending on uh, your proof search algorithm or the logic that you're dealing with, you might want to take one or the other as input. Uh, in this case, we're going to take sequence as input. <clears throat> now what you do is you apply the rules from your calculus bottom up over and over again to extract a proof. Now I put proof, this word in uh, quotation marks here, because what you might obtain in the end is something that is either is an actual proof in your calculus, or you might obtain something which looks a lot like a proof, but the initial sequence in the proof, which should be axioms, are not axioms. And you can actually use those, as I'll show in just a moment, to construct a counter model of your input formula. So let's go through how proof search works. So let's uh, take a sequence as input, and I'm going to show here the first case where we obtain a correct proof and why the input sequence is valid. So let's take this sequence as input. And let's start applying rules from our calculus bottom up or in reverse to this given sequence. So first I apply the implication right rule. This puts the negation p on the left. It keeps the q on the right. And now there's only one rule I can apply, which is the negation left rule. So I can take this not p and put it on the right so long as I strip it of its negation. And now we can see that this is a proof witnessing the validity of the input sequence. We know that our calculus is sound, as mentioned in the previous talk, meaning anything which is derivable is valid. So since we have a proof in this calculus of this sequence, we know that the sequence is valid. <clears throat> okay, let's look at what happens when our input is an invalid sequence. 
So here's an invalid sequence. We don't know, say, that it's invalid yet. We're doing proof search only once the algorithm is complete. So long as it, as it is a correct terminating proof search procedure, do we then know that our sequence is valid or invalid? But this one's invalid, of course, because I want to show an example of an invalid sequence. So again, I apply the implication right rule first, putting this R on the left-hand side, keeping the Q on the right, and then I apply the negation left rule bottom up, taking the P and putting it on the right. And now what's interesting is this top sequence shown here can be used to define a counter model for the conclusion of the proof. So remember that in classical propositional logic, our models or valuations, you might want to call them, assign truth values to propositional atoms in a formula, either one for true or zero for false. So the way that we define a counter model by making use of failed proof search here is every propositional atom which occurs on the left of our sequence is assigned true, and every propositional atom which occurs on the right-hand side is assigned false, namely P and Q. But depending on the logic that you're dealing with and the type of data structures that are used in your sequence, it might be much less trivial uh, or much more um, complicated to try to define a counter model for your invalid sequence. Here it's relatively easy because we're in the realm of classical propositional logic. Uh, so what's on the left becomes true and what's on the right becomes false. And now you can see that this valuation or this, this model invalidates the concluding sequence. Remember that a sequence is valid if and only if its formula interpretation is valid. So here's the formula interpretation of that concluding sequence. Now we can see that because P is false, not P is true, so we know that the antecedent of our implication is true. And since R is true and Q is false, the conclusion, which is this implication here, R implies uh, Q, is also false. So we have something true implying something false um, by the truth tables for a classical propositional logic, we know that this formula is therefore false. So this is how proof search works. You take a sequence or a formula's input, you apply the rules of your calculus in reverse. If what you obtain is a proof, you know the formula is valid. And so long as your calculus has nice properties, uh, if you obtain an incorrect proof, you can extract a counter model, witnessing the invalidity of your input. So this is one way that you can write decision procedures for logics by making use of their sequence systems. Okay, just a quick summary regarding what we went over, and then the talk will be complete. So at the beginning, I discussed invertibility and height-preserving invertibility. Uh, rules are invertible when drivability of their conclusions imply drivability of their premises. And this is uh, a height-preserving version of invertibility when deriving the conclusion with the derivation of a certain height um, implies that you can derive um, all the premises with derivations um, whose height is no bigger than the derivation of the uh, conclusion. We also discussed cut elimination. I talked about how this was proven based on the lexicographical ordering of pairs, where the first component of that pair consists of the complexity of the cut formula, namely uh, the number of logical connectives which occur within it, and how the second component of that pair consisted of the sum of the heights of the um, premises of the uh, cut instance that you're analyzing. Now, after you eliminate cut, which makes use of uh, invertibility results, as I showed uh, over the course of this talk, uh, you can then look at your system and judge it, as was our case. I mean, this isn't true in general, but this oftentimes occurs and is one way of showing decidability by looking at your system after you've eliminated cut and eliminated your structural rules. And by just looking at the rules, if you can see that you have the subformula property, meaning that all the formulae which occur in the premises are subformulae of those in the conclusion, then you can judge or determine that your logic is decidable. Because if you take a formula and you apply rules of reverse, after some finite period of time, um, a proof will be um, constructed. This process will stop. Or it limits the space. Another way of phrasing it is that it limits the space of proofs of any um, valid formula to a finite number. So you can just check through that space to see if a formula is derivable or not. Oh, after talking about the subformula property and decidability, I then gave an example of proof search to show you uh, how you can actually use a sequence system to design a decision procedure for logic and also to do counter model extraction. So that covers everything in uh, today's talk in part two of the Introduction to Proof Theory uh, lecture series.
I thank all of you very much for your attention.